The first activity this week was a reading which introduced you to the idea of articulatory settings. An articulatory setting is not the same as a particular articulation. We talk about an, an articulation as a way that the speech articulators make a particular sound, a vowel or a consonant in a language. But the articulatory setting for a given language runs throughout speech. It's the underlying way in which we hold all the different articulators and it obviously influences and affects all the different sounds we make. That's what we're going to be talking about in the next two videos and as ever you can download the slides I'll be using and there are notes on the right hand side of the page referring to what I'll be saying. We all know that our bodies are polyvalent. We can adapt them to, to the particular task which we want them to perform. So for different sports we hold ourselves in very different ways in order to achieve whatever the demands of that sport are. Languages are exactly the same and we could, equally, we could easily have a set of pictures like the ones you're looking at, which illustrate how the lips or the tongue or the jaw get used differently in English versus French versus Japanese or whatever. Now, when people look at articulatory settings, they tend to focus on the tongue because this is the most significant of the articulators. But when introducing the topic to students, we find that the lips are a good starting point. This is because students can consciously control their lips more easily than their tongue, and the results are much more evident. So in this video we're going to be looking at how to introduce articulatory settings by the lips and then in the next video we'll look at the tongue position for English. At the beginning of this session we asked you to note down one non-modelling pronunciation activity that you already do with your students. And quite a few of you mentioned that when you're introducing the aspirated P in English you illustrate this by asking students to take a piece of paper to put it in front of their lips and to say a word beginning with P in English and to say a word beginning with P in their first language if they don't have aspirated P's in that language. This is a good activity. It shows that there's something different going on with an English P as compared to the P's in many other languages. But the problem with it is that it's only showing the effect. It's not discussing the cause. It's not getting at the cause of what, why English has these aspirated P's. So if we're going to get our students to incorporate aspiration in their speech as a natural thing and not something that they have to, have to think about consciously, then we have to dig a little bit deeper and see what's going on, what creates the aspiration in an aspirated English P. In phonetics, the sound P is called a bilabial plosive. It's called a plosive because the sound creation mechanism is that of an explosion. The two lips are closed, the pressure builds up behind them, and the opening of the lips and the release of that pressure creates a noise, and that's the noise that we call a P. But there are different ways in which the lips can open. In French and Portuguese and many other languages, the lips are actively parted. So the jaw is dropped, and as a result, the lips open and the air comes out and you get an explosive P sound. In all the old native speaker varieties of English, a different approach is taken. The lips are relaxed, and the pressure buildup behind the lips blows the lips apart passively. This process is helped, of course, by the fact that in English on a stressed syllable, and aspiration only happens on stressed syllables, on a stressed syllable in English, there's a strong abdominal push. So there's more pressure being created, which can then be used to blow the lips apart. So let me illustrate these two types of P. For French and Portuguese and many other languages, the jaw just drops, so you might get ba. Ba, ba. For English, the pressure build up behind the lips and the relaxation of the lips means that the lips get passively opened. Pa, pa, pa. I'm not dropping my jaw, I'm just letting the pressure blow my lips apart. Try saying the words on the screen now, incorporating this mechanism for, create, for making a P. There are three elements to it the strong abdominal stress push, the relaxed lips, and finally, not moving the jaw, but instead letting the lips be blown apart passively by the pressure behind them. When you do this, you'll notice that there's a slight delay between the sound of the P, the explosion of air, and the vowel sound which comes up immediately afterwards. This is completely natural, it's a result just of the aerodynamics of the situation, and it's characteristic of English. If you make a P in the other way which I described before, um, so for languages like French or Portuguese, that is by keeping the lips quite tense and actively dropping the jaw, you'll notice that the vowel sound starts almost immediately after your lips are opened. 
So the difference in the sound which gets produced, not just in terms of the explosion and the size of the explosion and the aspiration sound, but also in the delay between that sound and the vowel which follows immediately afterwards. Here are some one and two syllable words to practice on. In the case of words in the second column, the second syllable, of course, will be produced on the remnants of the breath pulse. When your students start doing this, they won't get it right first time. They'll need to concentrate on each of the individual elements of these words in, in cycles like the one we've illustrated here until they can integrate everything together. So the first time they say the word, they might concentrate on getting their lips exactly right. The second time, making sure they have a good strong abdominal push. Then making sure that the second syllable genuinely gets produced on the remnants or leftovers of the breath pulse. And if they go through this cycle a few times, pretty quickly they'll be able to integrate everything and produce all the words in an authentic English way. Here's a longer phrase you can use for practice. Keep your lips relaxed throughout. There are three abdominal pushes creating three stressed and aspirated P's. And then there are five other, other syllables, all with schwa's in them. This is just a reminder that P's don't always get aspirated in English. The underlying cause of aspiration is the push with the abdominal muscles, and that of course only occurs on stressed syllables. So you get aspiration of P's when a P is at the start of a stressed syllable, but if it's at the start of an unstressed syllable, like in supper, there'll be no aspiration. And if it occurs at the end of a syllable, like in shop, again, there'll be no aspiration. In fact, with words like shop, although I might open my lips, it's perfectly acceptable not to even open, the, open one lips, one's lips at the end. Here are a couple of sentences, sentences which you can practice that with. And notice that you don't have to remember any rules about whether to aspirate P or not aspirate P. If you always have your lips quite relaxed, if you make a good strong abdominal push on the stressed syllables, then the stressed syllables will be aspirated and the unstressed syllables, because they're being produced on the remnants of the breath pulse, will naturally be unaspirated, as will the final P's in any word. Finally, let's compare the effect of the two types of P I described earlier on, on a simple word like the word spelled P-A, P-A. If we say it as it would be said in French, with the lips reasonably tense and the active dropping of the jaw in order to open the P, in order to open the explosion, then we get something like papa, papa. If we do it in English, where the lips are blown apart by the stress pulse, and in this case, of course, the stress pulse appears on the second syllable, and the first syllable will just be a stutter, a schwa sound will appear, but basically you're stuttering on P to get the first syllable before you get onto the stress syllable, then the result is something like this. Papa, papa. It's the same word, but it sounds dramatically different in the two languages.